I have got a confession to make. I am a junkie. I know I don't look like it, maybe, but I am addicted to special moments, moments of connection, moments of authenticity, what I call exhale moments. You know those times when we can just be, and in just being, we feel good enough, even with all our imperfections. I'm not so sure when this addiction started. I think it might have been when I was around four years old, and I was walking with some relatives when all of a sudden this huge dog came bounding over towards us. Okay, it was only four, so even a chihuahua may have looked huge. But I come from a family that absolutely adores dogs. And even at four years old, I was a pleaser. I wanted to conform to the expectations of others. And I knew I was expected to be ecstatic about this dog. And I wanted to love this dog, because I wanted to belong to my pack of relatives. There was only one problem. I was terrified. Now, the urging of my aunts to come out from behind my uncle's pant leg did nothing but create a bigger sense of shame and an even worse fear that I would disappoint that they would think less of me, that they might even stop loving me, because even four-year-olds can catastrophize. But I thought I'd risk the worst and tugged at my uncle's sleeve, and he bent down, and I whispered in his ear that I was afraid. And he understood, and he lifted me up in his arms, and he had me slowly introduce my hand to the dog, who of course licked it, and I became an ardent dog lover ever since that moment. But it was the first moment I recall consciously exposing my vulnerabilities of intentionally not living up to the expectations of others. It resulted not only in a teachable moment, but it also increased the bond between my uncle and myself. My fear had been accepted and not shamed, so my four-year-old dignity could remain intact. The result of an authentic moment. Um, a more recent event, though, happened uh, when I was trying to overcome the breakup of a relationship with a partner I thought I was going to grow old with. And I couldn't believe that I still couldn't get it right. I had been on this planet so many years, and I still screwed up. I mean, was it them? Was it me? I didn't know. I just knew that I felt my world had shattered. Anyways, I thought I was coping with it all right, but as often happens, the emotional distress started to leak out. You know, when the eyes start to water and the voice becomes a little husky and the eye contact averted. And this wouldn't have been so bad, except it was happening in the middle of a therapy session, which again wouldn't have been so bad, except I wasn't the client, I was the therapist. And anyways, I was lucky that a colleague of mine noticed that I was off my game and invited me into her office. And somehow her feelings of compassion allowed me to feel safe enough to toss aside any illusion of professional persona and instead start to share with her those very real human feelings of confusion and despair. At the end of our short time together, I felt emotionally drained, you know how you feel after a good cry, but also a lot clearer, a lot less fragile, a lot less alone. And she shared with me that she felt privileged that I had trusted her enough to let her in, that she felt closer to me. Authentic moments can often do that. They're a gift both given and received. I think it's moments like that that feed my addiction. And I don't think I'm the only one. I've been practicing as a, a therapist for over 25 years. And no matter what the presenting issues seem to be, my clients eventually begin to talk about those moments when they feel safe enough with another, where they feel good enough with who they are. Fellow moment junkies, I guess. Now, some of us can only feel that connection with Mother Nature, and others, when they feel connected to a higher power through their faith. For some, it's only with their pets. But for the luckier ones amongst us,
we can actually create those moments with other members of our species. I'm often remembered of how powerful those moments can be. About a few years back, I was asked to facilitate a two-day training workshop. The purpose was to help destigmatize mental health issues. And just to share a, a fact with you, one out of three Canadians will be diagnosed with a mental health issue during their lifetime. And that number is based on those who have actually sought help. So I think we'd be very naive to think there's somebody in this room today who has not been touched with somebody who's struggling with a mental health issue. But how many of us talk about it? How many of us instead retreat and struggle alone? Anyways, back to that workshop, there were about 24 participants, many of whom had worked together for many years. And it just took one brave soul to open up and start to share with the group her family's struggle with mental health issues. She talked of bearing witness to her mother's chronic, debilitating struggle with profound depression. How her mother rarely left her darkened bedroom, rarely joined the family for meals her several suicide attempts. And she talked of how, as a little girl, she felt maybe she was responsible for her mother's illness. Was she not pretty enough or smart enough or ultimately maybe not lovable enough for her mother to want to stay alive? Anyway, she began to tell her story rather tentatively because being emotionally vulnerable is not only hard, but new for most of us. But her, her uh, courage was recognized by the compassion and the acceptance of those listening to her story. And she gained a lot more courage from exposing her vulnerability. Very often, exposing our true selves in a safe place can make us feel stronger. And her strength encouraged and inspired some others in the group to do the same over those two days. And the feedback afterwards talked of a renewed energy in the workplace, a communal tenderness, a having felt seen and accepted, which allowed them to be kinder to each other and ultimately to themselves. The result of an authentic moment. And although those moments might not last very long, the impact can often be felt over a lifetime. And I say that because I've had the opportunity to work with clients in palliative care. And they are very often quite reflective and generous with the sharing of their life stories. And what has struck me is that no matter how tortuous or even triumphant their lives have been, it is those moments of connection that bring a smile and where they return to again and again in their mind's eye. Those moments when they were courageous enough just to be with another, to toss out any need to perform or need to be perfect, and just stand undefended and vulnerable that seems to have made the most impact and to have brought them the most pride. To feel worthy enough to have another pause look right at them and want to understand them, want to bridge the gap between them. No judgment only acceptance and compassion, which allowed them during those moments and at the moment of their deaths to feel more kindness and compassion towards themselves as well. And this being kind to ourselves is no easy task, especially in our society these days where personal improvement is seen as this noble goal. Not personal growth, although it might be packaged that way, but personal improvement seen as a constant striving a striving for youth, a striving for stoic independence, a striving for material goods, a striving for perfection, for having the best, doing the best, and of course, being the best. But in order to pursue best, it means you have to be constantly measuring yourself up against others. Otherwise, how would you know that best was achieved? And you need the others to see you as best as well. So we become preoccupied with the judgment of others. We give up our agency to them. Our self-esteem, our self-worth is dependent or in the hands of 
the minds of those outside of ourselves. It leaves us in a disempowered position, which creates a lot of anxiety, because God forbid we expose our flawed selves. So we put a lot of energy into creating this cloak of defenses, trying to be what people think we should be, or what we think people want us to be. And this significantly interferes with the ability to create authentic moments. Because in order to create those moments, mind to mind, heart to heart, we need to refocus the energy we use in maintaining that cloak of defenses and focus it outwards towards the other. Not to try to figure out how the other is judging us, or how we're different, or who's right, who's wrong, who's best, but instead try to recognize and focus and remind ourselves of those human connections, those human bonds that connect us all. And ironically, the striving not to be the best in those moments often brings out the best in us. So why are we talking about authentic moments today? Well, I think it's because we're living in extremely challenging times. Environmental issues, human rights, social justice, our local and domestic concerns all demand our urgent attention. And I don't believe authentic moments are end goals onto themselves. Instead, I see them as essential first steps towards change. Because when we are creating authentic moments, we're refusing to buy into those polarized stereotypes of right and left and them and us. And instead, we choose to focus on those human qualities that we all share. And we gain strength and inspiration and momentum from reminding ourselves that we're not alone. And this momentous, momentum pushes us forwards to action. So let us not waste any more moments. Let us, from this moment on, begin the process of change. From this moment on, let us become moment junkies together. Join me in my addiction. Our world is hungry for us. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.